we'll all kick things off. Um, a couple more people have joined in the room and there's plenty of people online. I'm sure there's going to be some more people joining as well as we go. Um, so I'm Simon, for those who haven't met me, so I'll be moderating the session. And this will be the fourth seminar in the Tissue Image Analytics Centre seminar series. So we try and do those um, around two times every month. Um, and of course, we, we try and make sure that those speakers are going to present something related to computational pathology, which brings us on to our presenter today, which will be Dr. Faisal Mahmood. So a real pleasure to have you here today, Faisal. So just to um, give a description of Faisal's background. So Dr. Mahmood is an assistant professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School and the Division of Computational Pathology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He received his PhD in biomedical imaging from Okinawa, forgive me if I've said that wrong, um, Institute of Science and Technology, Japan, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Biomedical Engineering at John Hopkins University. Faisal's research interests include pathology image analysis, morphological feature and biomarker discovery using data fusion and multimodal analysis. Dr. Mahmood is a full member of the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Cancer Center, an associate member of the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, and a member of the Harvard Bioinformatics and Integrative Genomics faculty. So just to give people an idea on how this session will be run, so Faisal's um, agreed to have this run as an interactive seminar where people can ask questions as we go. Um, so if, if you want to just raise your hand if you have any questions and we can field those as we go. Um, but apart from that, like I said, it's a, a pleasure to have you here, Faisal, and you can present whenever you're ready. I'm going <clears> to <throat> start by sharing my screen. Um, I think I need to make you the host. Just give me one second. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Just, no. um, Okay, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, can I see your screen? Okay, so I'll, I'll try to answer questions as, as I go through it, so as long as I can see your, see your hand, is, hand is raised. I think uh, there is a mechanism to do that. But um, so thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks for the introduction. So uh, as Simon mentioned, I'm Faisal. I run a small group of about 22 students and postdocs at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and today I'll be talking about some of the work that we have, uh, we have done on data efficient and multimodal computational pathology. Um, so I'll start by saying a little bit about what my lab does in general and what we're interested in. And uh, also it's a projection of what, the, what a lot of the computational pathology community in general is, is interested in these days. We try to make sense of a lot of phenotypic data and this ranges from h and &E, IHC to multi multiplex, increasingly to multiplex immunofluorescence data and so forth. So this includes um, data that's collected for uh, regular clinical workflows, as well as data that might be collected for specific projects in research. And we try to um, take this data and do some kind of quantitative spatial analysis. And this could be um, going to some kind of a spatial representation followed by integration or followed by correlation of those uh, spatial features with some kind of an outcome. And that outcome could be diagnosis and prognosis, uh, and, but it could also be things like response to treatment, try to find patients into better distinct risk groups, or trying to uh, find new biomarkers, uh, morphologic biomarkers. But um, we already have uh, a lot of these modalities that are quantitative, and these include um, a, a host of multi-omic uh, data, which we have, have access to. Um, and this ranges from genomic transcriptomics and recently in increasingly proteomic data as well. So, so these are, uh, are sort of data sets where we already have quantitative features mapped out or have been used for certain kinds of research uh, in the past or 
ongoing trials and so forth. So, so our hope is sort of, can we uh, integrate data from all of these multiple multiple sources to do everything here here in the red box? Um, and then of course we can study things like correspondences and so forth. Um, uh, to a degree, what my group really does is that we try to address some of the technical challenges in trying to achieve achieve all of this um, using very large scale uh, large scale data sets and making it easy uh, for others to sort of use those tools and, and run their own uh, own own projects. Um, this is a list that I think I've shown shown quite often. It's uh, it's, a, it's a list of major challenges as we see it in pathology image analysis. Um, these days, and these sort of range from um, limited data, lim limited available data that you can sort of directly use to domain adaptation, structured prediction, incorporating data from multiple information. Of course, this is a this is increasingly becoming a hot topic, and how how can we integrate data from multiple multiple sources? But it's uh, it's really not recent. There, it's, it's it's something that has been going going on for the past past twenty years. There are journals that are named Data Fusion and and people have been looking into how data from multiple sources can be can be integrated, and then finally, it's that how can we make these models more interpretable, reliable, and so forth. Um, so I'm I'm sure that a lot of people in the in the audience are already familiar with this, but just to give a brief overview of the of of the method spectrum in general, because I'll be talking about some of the methods that we have we have developed. So there's a just looking at how. Uh, the field has progressed historically. There, there was, for for about a, a decade, there there was a lot of push in in developing all kinds of different handcrafted features and having some form of learning on top of that. And and the goal has always been, uh, sort of, um, in 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 the past, literature has almost always been towards two two basic um, aims. It's it's diagnosis based on existing human knowledge or its, its prognosis, which from a, from a machine learning point of view is an ordinal uh, ranking or ordinal regression uh, problem. So uh, stratifying patients into distinct risk groups. Um, about six to seven years ago, with the, with, as, as convolutional neural networks became more common, um, it, it has increasingly become common that someone would go into this mega uh, gigapixel whole slide image and annotate the um, annotate the region of interest, and this could be anything, cancer, positive, whatever, whatever uh, peculiar feature that you're trying to find in, find in, the, uh, in, in this image, and, then, and, and everything else would become a, another class, and you'd solve it as being a binary or a multi-class classification problem by training it end-to-end -end on, on these tiny, tiny patches. Um, I'll talk more about this in, in, in the next few slides, but an issue with this approach, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are already familiar with this problem, but an issue with this approach is that someone has to go in and annotate these, these slides, which can become very, very tedious as you're moving towards lots and lots of images and you want to cater to the heterogeneity that really exists in these, in these, uh, in these cancers. Um, of course, all of this, you know, all of, all of the machine learning that we assume, we, we often, uh, assume discretization of, uh, of these diseases, but in reality, biology is very, very continuous. So, um, so, so there is very large amounts of heterogeneity across patients. Uh, um, there's this tem temporal heterogeneity as well as uh, heterogeneity across, uh, across different patient cohorts. Um, so a solution to that is uh, that we can use some form of, uh, of weekly supervised learning. So you could, you could have these whole slide images and, uh, and, and use slide level labels that were already present in pathology reports. And uh, there are two common ways of doing this. Uh, you could use graph convolutional networks where you could segment out. One way of doing that would be to segment out all the nuclei in the image, build a graph on top of it, and then use some form of graph convolutional uh, networks. And the other way would be to use multiple instance learning where you assume that a whole slide image is a bag of, of small patches and then uh, use MIL on top of uh, on top of that, and this is an approach that my group has used quite a lot, um, and I'll say more about that in the next few slides as to why why we, we, we prioritize this. Um, the third category, of course, which is becoming increasingly interesting and and uh, increasingly used and studied is is uh, self supervised as well as fully fully unsupervised sort of methods. So self supervised. Uh, Realm sort of gives you the ability to train rich feature encoders that then can be used for some kind of downstream uh, task. And that could be a supervised task as, as well as other unsupervised tasks like just clustering the features and, 
and finding common morphologic features across large patient cohorts. So one way to look at this, um, and, uh, and, and this has just sort of come about in talking to a lot of, of, a lot of our clinical collaborators is that throughout, throughout the history of pathology and more so uh, you can just say this, that throughout the history of medicine in general, the way new morphologic features or new features about disease have come about is that someone is looking at a large cohort of patients and often this is happening manually. And then they're correlating that with some form of outcome or how the patients do in the long run. This could be in relation to some certain kind of treatment or not. But the goal is really to find common morphologic features or common features uh, that are predictive of something across large patient cohorts. And this really gives us the ability to do that at, at scale and on its own. So uh, this is of course uh, a very interesting direction. So coming, coming back to uh, building supervised models from whole site images and, and, uh, uh, and labels. So just to give another brief overview, this is a typical workflow on how deep learning is used for, uh, for pathology. And uh, this is, I mean, as, if this has been happening for the past six or seven years, you can find tens of studies doing this where you have some form of annotated regions, you chop it up into tiny, tiny, uh, tiny patches. Those patches have certain kinds of annotations. You can train a, train a CNN on top of it and you can end up with something like this where it's really a proof of concept that, that, that the CNNs can be used for diagnosis and prognosis. Uh, you can do this with, with outcome prediction where you can rank the, 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 the patient's uh, into distinct, distinct risk groups. And then you can also interpret it to a degree by using things like reading class activation maps, where you would get an interpretation at the level of the, of the patch or the region of interest that you're looking at, at what, what was the most important morphologic feature that was, that was driving that, that prediction. Um, and this is really a proof of concept that, that deep learning can be used to do all of those things. And, and it's, it's been tried and tested in so many different disease models. So as I mentioned, so our, um, uh, Goal was to how 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 can we do this uh, in a weekly supervised manner? Can we use uh, the whole slide image and slide level labels, which are already available in pathology reports? And the answer is yes, but the issue is that each whole slide image is going to become a single data point. So so this billion pixel image ends up being a single single data point, um, which of course is is not that easy. Uh, so we we came up with this with this wish list, and you know I've I've shown this before, so I'm I'm going to go through it quickly, but um, the goal here really was to see if we can build something that is is easy to use, and our clinical trainees can can use it in our in our department, and 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 something that would let us train models uh, uh, quickly, and the models will still be you know uh, robust, and and we we could validate them in 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 a, in a heuristic uh, heuristic manner without having to you know go through things like. Uh, pixel level annotations or doing large pre-processing steps or requiring tens of thousands of whole slide images and so so forth and it also has to be computationally efficient if you if you're if you're saying that you need a you need a large cluster to train these models it really is not going to have the kind of penetration that we wanted to wanted to have so we want um our clinical trainees uh to really um come up with ideas that that they that they think of during their clinical uh, training and uh, then then ask questions that can then, then be addressed by the pipeline. So that was our hope. Um, and we looked into other weekly supervised paradigms that that uh, are commonly used. And, and the most common one that we found was uh, was using slide level uh, labels and then assigning the same label to every patch in the image. And this um, this approach, this this slide level label approach um, works to a degree with larger sections where there's large tumor content. Uh, but if you're trying to trying to apply this to um, disease models where only a fraction of the whole slide image corresponds with the morphology that you're looking for, this doesn't really work very well because a majority of your patches would essentially be noisy. The other approach is to use vanilla uh, multiple instance learning, and, and this has been used uh, quite a lot. Um, the, the issue with using vanilla multiple in, in instance learning that we found was that if, if you're using a max pooling based aggregation function, your uh, deep network can be updated by a single patch, which means that, um, which means that you could essentially be, um, be, be sort of underutilizing these gigapixel images in, in training the model. And this is why it becomes incredibly data inefficient if you need tens of thousands of images to to train a model that would be robust enough to for any kind of downstream clinical clinical task. So uh, 
this, uh, this study that was published in Nature Medicine in 2019 showed that you needed about 10,000 host site images to get the same kind of performance that one would one would get at um, at, a, at a whole slide uh, at, at, at a fixed level annotated uh, setup. So uh, our you know, goal was, uh, as I was coming in and starting the group, was, was really look look at a data efficient way of doing this. And and the reason is is, is several fold, right? So you can do this with rare conditions, clinical trials, patient stratification, things that are inherently more interesting to look at beyond just classification. But but also um, to uh, to sort of sort of cater to to the availability of uh, of data for some of these disease models, so so we came up with this method that we called called CLAM. It's 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 a method that's relatively very easy to use and, and has the, since it, since it came out, there has been a large community that has built around it. Um, so it, it uses a number of bells and whistles, and, and none of these are sort of incredibly fancy. These these are just existing things that already existed in machine learning literature, and you sort of put them together to. Uh, to, to have a mechanism where you could really easily train your train your model, so so use attention-based pooling instead of uh, max pooling. So so this this sort of aggregates patch level features into a slightly level representation for classification by learning which patches are most uh, most important. And then we, we use n parallel branches that together together can calculate you know unique uh, uh, um, n unique slide level representations. This sort of makes the, the setup multi-class. So. Uh, a majority of the work that was done in, uh, done in MIL was was for binary problems, and this allowed it to be multi-class. We have pseudo labels in there. Uh, as the model is sort of learning, we can generate pseudo labels and use those to to increase uh, as as a, as an increased uh, supervisory signal during training. And the last one, and perhaps the most important one, is that is a realization that the re re ResNet feature encoder uh, can be used. Uh, re ResNet feature encoders can be used to um, or ImageNet trained feature encoders can be used to extract features that are rich enough for a majority of, cla of, of classification problems where a human can look at a slide and say that this, this is X, Y, and Z. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll have a discussion later about some of the non-human identifiable features that often exist in these, uh, in these images. But um, we found that for a majority of problems where it was relatively easy for, for people to look at a case and, and categorize what it is, Resonant feature encoders uh, were enough, and and this came about after you know, uh, a, a lot of uh, um, a lot of work we did with self supervised encoders, and and we could get to a point where the the performance of these self supervised encoders could be comparable or could be a little bit better um, than uh, than than the Resonant encoders trained on ImageNet, but they were never drastically better. So we concluded that you know for majority of problems. Um, if the ResNet features worked uh, very, very well. So a set of works like this, and I think some people are already familiar with this, we have a whole set of images, segment the tissue, we patch everything, we, we extract ResNet features. So this was a ResNet 34, the first, so it's a truncated ResNet 34, first three layers uh, were used. We have an attention backbone, and then, and then there are multiple attention branches. Um, and then we basically score uh, each patch based on the attention, then we pull it. Uh, and then there's instance level clustering, which sort of clusters some more similar morphologic features together. Um, and then because we have attention built in there, it's interpretable to a degree, at, at least at a patch level, where we can go in and look at these uh, the, 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 the patches that were most important and rank them and then project them back to the slide to get, to get something like this, where you can then even quantitatively evaluate how it, how it correlates with uh, what a pathologist would typically be looking at. So there was quite, quite some... Uh, Analysis on this, so this was for renal cell carcinoma subtyping, and we compared it with other other models. And renal cell carcinoma is is obviously it's a very very easy classification problem, but the reason we we, we targeted it is because multi-class. So uh, we looked at uh, comparisons with vanilla and max pooling based uh, multiple instance learning as well as slide level labels, where we assign the uh, the label that's given in the report to every patch uh, every patch on the image, and then we also did some analysis by reducing the number of cases. That were used for training to get an idea about how the model would perform when fewer, uh, fewer and fewer cases are used, as well as looking at how it adapts to independent, independent test cohorts, and then going in and looking at what morphologic features it's using. There are also there's also some quantitative analysis about this in the publication. If people are interested in looking at it further, there's a demo if people are uh, interested in looking at that. Um, and then we could we could go in and and and, and look at. Um, 
if we, if we cluster these features at the patch level, similar morphologic features cluster together, we, we further extended this to, to breast cancer, lymph, lymph node metastases, or the, or the chameleon benchmarks. Uh, and we did a lot of analysis around that, both on, uh, on, on, the, on the challenges themselves, as well as independent test cohorts, and also compared it with uh, multiple instance learning, as well as assigning slide level labels. So here, one thing to see is that, is that the slide level labels really sort of fails, particularly with lower, um, uh, lower number of data points. And, and the reason is that uh, often the lymph node metastases corresponds to a smaller region um, in, the, in the whole slide image, particularly if you're looking at micrometastases or independent tumor cells, but as compared to something like a lung cancer section where you're trying to subtype these, these cases. So uh, we, th there's also some quantitative analysis where we compare what, where the attention heat maps are with the, with the A1A3 uh, staining and, and sort of further introspect and investigate that. And then to see how adaptable these models are, we also uh, adapted them to images that were taken with a cell phone coupled to, coupled to a microscope. Uh, and uh, we found that the models were adaptable. There was some decrease in performance from using whole slide images to using cell phone uh, microscopy images, uh, but the models were, were still adaptable. Um, uh, Bao and Chen and undergrad were working in my lab, have developed this 3D printed uh, microscope, which is essentially a reverse optical setup. It has a Raspberry Pi to, to capture the images. And then there's a Jetson Nano where you can port your PLAM model. So you can capture these images in the, oh. in the Raspberry Pi and import them to the to the um, uh, to, to the Jetson Nano, where, where an interpretation could essentially be uh, be made. Um, is there is there a question? I didn't hear a question. Let me just look to the chat. Okay. I don't think there's any questions in the chat. Um, okay. If you okay. wouldn't mind. Your um, part on CLAM, and then we can maybe go through a few questions there. Okay, so uh, um, <coughs> okay, so uh, this was a reverse optical setup, as I, as I mentioned. This is uh, this is a sort of an exploded view of it, where you can look at the different components, what what it has. But basically, it's it's an imager. It's a very basic imager. You can you can capture images in the extreme limit. <coughs> that's an end where you can run the the, the pre-trained uh, pre-trained model. So this is the overall setup. You can train your models on. These whole slide images and import it to this hundred dollar processor, which can then be uh, looked at in the, which, is, which can essentially then be, then be deployed in the, in, uh, in in like an actual actual setting. So here here are a few examples uh, in the performance on uh, this is I, I, I think this is on uh, lung yes this is on lung cancer uh, detection uh, subtyping as well as detecting whether it's primary or uh, metastatic. Uh, for both uh, uh, frozen sections as well as FFP. So, so this is the performance on whole slide images and this is the performance on images that were taken directly from the, uh, from the microscope. Um, these are uh, the heat maps corresponding to that and we can look at how uh, it corresponds with the whole slide image as well as how it corresponds with images that were taken just with this cheap, uh, cheap microscope. This is what the setup looks, at, looks like uh, currently and we're trying to further miniaturize it and, and test it in actually lower source lower source setting. We also looked at adapting whole slide images to biopsies and we did some analysis analysis there and we found that models in general were, were adaptable. Um, so uh, what one reason that we were sort of after trying to develop a mechanism where we could uh, train whole slide images with slide level labels while still being data efficient and, and sort of making it easy to, to train because we wanted to target the problem, problem of cancers of unknown primary. So, um, I think a lot of people in the audience are already already familiar with this problem, but for those who are not, when cancer metastasizes and moves from one region to uh, one, one part of the body to, to, to the, the other, often at first presentation, it would become unclear as to where the origin of the tumor is. And identifying the origin of the tumor is, is quite important because, yes, there's a Hafez, if you don't mind, if we can um, pause here just before you go on to this um, this part of your research. Maybe we can field a few questions and then we can resume the presentation. Are you okay with that? Yes. Perfect. So anybody in the audience, if you have any questions, please raise your hand or you can type in the chat. Okay, so we have one question from the audience. First he says, hello from Peru. Um, he says, he or she, I should say, sorry, says we are a new hospital in a remote area and we want to digitize 
our images to send them to a reference hospital in the capital of Peru. However, we are wondering if we will need an external memory because these images are very heavy, I guess, mem memory intensive. Do you have any comments on that, Faisal? Um, so I, I, I didn't quite you know, and, and understand the question. So they're, they're trying to send images from, from one hospital to the other and whether they would require external memory. So yeah, I don't, so, so yeah. of, of course, I mean, I mean, I, I guess the easiest way would be to just send them over, over the cloud if, if you have, have that available. Right. Yeah, I guess you need to have some some quite sophisticated storage to store these images, right? Because they can be quite memory intensive. Yeah. So one question that I've got is, um, that that I've been wondering. So first of all, thanks for this um, this work. I know our our group has been um, reading it recently, and we find it really interesting. So thanks again. So I'm I'm quite interested in knowing how you. I don't know whether you've thought about this or whether you're doing it at the moment, but how how do you actually um, present? this work or these results to the pathologist? Do you um, only look at the heat maps when there's some kind of discordance or do you just present the heat map to the pathologist and expect them to then make the diagnosis? Or do you just fully trust the, the prediction that's being made? So I think that there are a number of different ways how we're, how we're envisioning that this could be integrated into the, into the workflow, right? So, so my hope is that we would be able to do a little bit of both. So the case, the cases where the model would be, for, so first of all, for the tasks that are relatively easy for a pathologist to do, and then where the model would be very, very confident, those, those can just be triaged, right? So those are potentially very, the, the model is very accurate at doing that. If the, you know, if, if, if the confidence is 0 0.99, you can just triage those. All other cases, a pathologist can look at those with the heat map, and then they could make an interpretation uh, from that. And that would essentially we hope decrease their time, and I'll show that in, a, in another example in the, in, in, the, in the following slide. Yeah. Okay. And so, do you present it as a heat map, like you showed in the slide, or do you have have some ideas about how you might present that to the to the pathologists? Yeah. So, so we have a demo uh, for the setup that we are currently using. So you can see the the heat map and the and the, and the actual slides side by side, or and you can toggle between the two, as well as having some kind of an interpretation. With it, so you can have an interpretation for for what the model model look, model uh, thinks it is, and what the confidence is, as well as looking at the heat map. So both, yeah. Okay, thanks. And so there's no more questions, so I'm going to ask one more. If that's okay, Faisal. So quite interesting to hear because I was actually going to ask this question, but you beat me to it actually by explaining it. Um, so you mentioned that you also tried with self-supervised learning. Right. So I'm just interested to find or to hear about what you trained, um, what you trained on for self-supervised self learning, because of course this also depends on the data that you're actually using. Right. Can you maybe shed some light into that? Yeah, we, we did all kinds of different experiments. We used mm -hmm. tens of thousands of images, in, including everything in the TCGA, as well as you know, everything that we have uh, collected here uh, at the Brigham so far. Um, and we use a, a variety of different paradigms from SimCLR and uh, to, to MoCo and, and everything that sort of was available at the time. And, and we, 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 we did see some improvements for downstream tasks, uh, but the improvements were not drastic enough. Um, the, we, for, for a majority of classification tasks, we found that the ResNet encoder did, did very well and we couldn't find a statistically significant difference. Um, more recently, we've done some work uh, where we use Dino and many more images uh, that, that has resulted in, in some improvement. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I think that it, it just depends on the task, uh, what, what kind of downstream task that you're trying to, trying to do, whether it's justified to, to, to have a self-supervised encoder or not. Okay, perfect. So I think there's no more questions, so you can please carry on, Faisal. Simon, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there's one, one just popped up, yeah, okay. So one, one question um, just came in and Mohsin said, predicting gene expression or molecular labels from h &E image using end-to-end -end deep learning shows promising results. Has CLAM been tested on such tasks? And is there any insight about that? So we, we have tried to, to use uh, CLAM for those tasks. And it, it depends on what 
you know, what molecular feature that you're trying to, trying to predict. Um, so it, it, it didn't work uh, as well as pixel level annotated models do because I think that it's important to have the tumor region mapped out. Uh, but we have since tried some, um, some models where we uh, do sort of a multitask prediction where, we, where you're trying to predict both the, the tumor type as well as the, uh, the mutation where it did show some promising results. Um, but that's not an area where we have sort of actively explored. Um, I think that we've also uh, tried different kinds of self-supervised encoders with, uh, with mutation prediction. And yeah, that has also shown some, some promising results. But our overall conclusion was um, that CLAM worked very well where, where morphologic features were very, very distinct. It didn't work very well with uh, the sort of non-human identifiable features where you're trying to predict molecular targets on its own just by using, you know, it's a very simple setup just by using resonant features. It didn't do very well. Okay, interesting, thank you. So then just, just one, one, more, um, one more question, and it's to do with, well, can, can you maybe just um, expand on CLAM's ability to detect micro tumors and um, isolated tumor cells? Does it do well still when you've got just a small um, structure within the tissue that will change the, the entire class of the slide? What, what's your comments or thoughts about that? We, we had, um, I, I, I think it did do quite well on lymph node, lymph node metastases. And we, we, we sort, of, sort of tried to push the, push the bounds by looking at things that whether it can detect a single bacterium or things like that, where it just completely failed. Um, so it, it, it depends sort of on the problem that you're, you're looking at. If, if I, I think that if there's just a single independent tumor cell, it'll probably just fail. Um, if there are micrometastases, it does pick those up. That's, uh, that's been my, um, my interpretation. And, and, and that might just have to do with the fact that you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not really context aware. It, it works at a single, single resolution. Yeah. Maybe it's to do with the, just the inherent limitation of weekly supervised learning in these sort of scenarios as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, please um, continue, Faisal. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll continue on to the, to the next project. I, I, I think that uh, a lot of people in the audience are familiar with what this, what this issue is. Uh, we're trying to predict the origin of cancers once cancer has, has metastasized. And the reason to do that is that it, it, it's often unclear at first presentation where the origin is and most of the um, cancers are treated based on the origin and many patients cannot enroll into clinical trials unless the origin is determined. Some trials have an explicit requirement for the origin being sort of delineated before, they, before people can enroll in these trials. So um, our um, sort of the question that we wanted to answer is that can we use uh, conventional H&E &E images that are, that are sort of part of the regular diagnostic workflow to determine where the origin is, or can we at least assist with you know, the downstream ancillary tests that are, that are conducted? So our setup was, uh, was something like this. We used 22,000 or 22,000 whole slide images grouped into 18 common cancer origins for training the model. And then we tested it on about 6,500 cases of both primary and metastatic tumors where the origin was known. And then we did some further analysis on increasingly difficult metastatic uh, cases. And the reason to do that is because it's very difficult to find ground truth for unknown primary cases. We also had an external test set of about 682 cases that came from 223 different medical centers. And then finally, we had a multi-center unknown primaries data set that came from over 150 medical centers and we had about 743 cases, but after clinical correlation identified 317 cases where some form of a primary differential was, was assigned. And, and I think the interesting part here is to look at how um, sort of uh, what the differential is between the, the data that was available for training for cancers that are common, so such as malignant breast versus the ones that are not very common or rare, so such as adrenal and, and cervix and so forth. Um, and this was, a, this was a setup that was very similar to CLAM where we used ResNet features. Um, it was solved as being a multitask problem. So uh, both uh, predicting whether the case is primary or metastatic, as well as making a prediction of where the, where the origin is. Um, and uh, we did quite a lot of analysis on this, uh, looking at the top one, top three, and top five accuracies, because our hope was that if 
if the number, um, if, if we can narrow down what the possible origins are, we can use downstream ancillary, uh, we, we can reduce the, down, the, the, the number of downstream ancillary tests and, and eventually get to a origin prediction early on. Um, we also did quite a lot of analysis on the primary problem of primary versus uh, static for common origins. Um, uh, and, and then th this, this is the overall performance for all 18 cancer types. This is the, the, the uh, one versus rest performance for origin prediction, as well as for the bi binary problem of primary versus metastatic on both internal and external test cohorts. And overall, the performance was, was quite reasonable. Uh, we looked at model confidence, and we found that cases that were correctly classified had a, had a higher confidence. Uh, this, this shows that that can be used some kind, as some kind of an indicator for how reliable um, or how much should the sh should the pathologist or oncologist who are looking at this trust the, the results that come out from the model. And then we did quite a lot of analysis on just metastatic tumors, looking at all 18 regions. And then further looking at, at cases that were increasingly difficult to establish utility on unknown primary cases. And for that, we used the number of ancillary tests that were used as a surrogate marker for difficulty of the case. And then, and then looking at how the model performs at that uh, on, on those cases. Um, and then also uh, looking at cases that were categorized as being uh, poorly differentiated or as, uh, as, as, as having clinical, some form of clinical correlation, if that was recommended in the pathology report, um, we, we looked at those cases and we found that the model did quite well uh, for top one accuracy, but it did even better for top three. So it's very, very good at narrowing down what the possible, possible origins were. Uh, we introspected and investigated a lot of the, um, a lot of the high attention regions within the within the whole slide images uh, to see um, to, to to see what the model was 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 predominantly paying attention to, and uh, we also did some quantitative analysis by using Coronet on on the high attention regions and found that the model was predominantly using uh, tumor regions for all eighteen cancer types as well as for um, as well as for, uh, for 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 the entire data set as as a whole. Um, and this gives, gives, us, gives us at least some confidence uh, at, to, to the interpretation of the model because you look at the high attention regions, pick about 10% of the high attention patches and then quantify what we can in the tumor microenvironment and, and then uh, sort of introspect where, the, where those predictions may be coming from. Um, so this is sort of the demo that I was talking about earlier. So, you, so, so this is sort of one way I think that how this, how this can be used uh, to assist. Uh, pathologists, every incoming metastatic case could go through, uh, could, could, could go through uh, a toad model and it would produce a top three origin prediction as well as with, uh, with, the, with the confidence and how confident the model is about those uh, predictions. And then downstream ancillary tests could be ordered based off of that. There's a demo for this if people are interested in looking at this further. Um, and then on the unknown primaries cases, we had about 743 of those. And then we looked into all of their EMRs that were available to us. And, and admittedly, many of them did have missing EMRs. And uh, the ones that we could find all the EMRs for, we, we looked at, we, we found 317 cases where some form of a primary differential was, was assigned. And then we broke those down into two different categories, those with a high certainty differential and then those with a low certainty differential. This means that the high certainty differential just had more evidence for where the origin is. And while this is not a perfect ground truth and should never be considered a perfect ground truth, we, we can get some sense of how the model would do on unknown primary cases without running sort of a trial or something like a long-term clinical, clinical test where we look at the patient outcome that if they're treated on, uh, on, on origins predicted by the classifier. So uh, we found that top one was, it was, it was not very high, but it, but it was still reasonable. Um, the higher confidence cases did, 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 did better, but the top three and top five were, were the performance was quite high. So, so this sort of tells us that we can use this for uh, a downstream, uh, uh, we, we can use it, use it for some kind of downstream clinical applicability where we can, you know, um, reduce the number of ancillary tests that are conducted. Here's an example for that. So this, this case required all of these different IHC tests to get to a determination. If you had a toad model available, you could get a prediction something like this, and then you could use this prediction to order downstream ancillary tests to confirm what the origin is. Um, and then of course, looking at the high tension region and everything. So the, the, the demo and the, and the code for this is, is publicly available if people want to continue uh, um, exploring this further. 
So the next project I'll talk about is for endomyocardial uh, biopsy assessment. Oh, okay, so there, are, I, I believe there are questions. Yeah, sorry, Thank, thanks for stopping there, Basil. Okay. Um, yeah, so th thanks for explaining that. That was really interesting. So we have one question from the audience, from Fires, and he said, what was the precision of predicting the correct site as the top prediction within the set of non-primary or metastatic subset only? Do you have any indication in, into that? Right, so, so we have that in the, in the study. Um, I think I, I believe it's in extended data too. So, 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 these, so this performance is only on metastatic uh, cases, right? So this, this is the origin prediction. This is a confusion matrix showing for all 18 only on metastatic cases. And all of this performance here is also on, on metastatic cases. So um, I believe it, 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 was, it was over 80% uh, on, uh, on both uh, internal as well as external test cohorts. Um, but I think looking at just metastatic cases does not give you an idea about how it will do on unknown primes. Looking at difficult metastatic cases would. So this is why we further you know, subcategorize the metastatic cases as those having you know, those that where the, where the determination could be made with no IITs at all. And then those that required quite a lot of ancillary tests to make a determination, followed by also looking at cases that were poorly differentiated and inherently you know, difficult for, for a pathologist to, to analyze. So, so looking at increasingly difficult metastatic cases does give an indication of how it would do on, on unknown primers. Okay, thank you. It'd be quite interesting to know as well whether there's an understandable misclassification. So for example, for some of those misdiagnosed cases, um, are the morphologies um, quite similar? For example, maybe um, two different kinds of adenocarcinoma or yeah. from the GI, yeah, for so example? We, we did a lot of uh, analysis on the, on the misclassified cases um, not on all of them, but, but a majority of them, we did do a lot of a lot of uh, analysis, and, and that's what we found. So, if the morphology is similar, or there are many many unknown primary cases where you can't make out anything at all, it's just so poorly differentiated that they all look very very similar. Like uh, there's, there's no no differentiation possible whatsoever. Whatsoever. So if they're so advanced, that's the that's what we found that the. It's, it's difficult for, for the pathologists to identify it even with many years of experience and it's difficult for the model to identify it as well. Okay, interesting. Yeah, please go ahead then, Faisal. Okay. Um, okay, so the next uh, study that I was gonna talk about was related to endomyocardial biopsy assessment. So after cardiac, uh, cardiac transplants, um, Patients often undergo a surveillance into myocardial biopsies to determine whether the heart, uh, the, the, the recipient is rejecting the donor, donor heart. So this is a problem where there is uh, quite a lot of inter and intra-observer variability among pathologists and the downstream sort of uh, consequences of misinterpretation could be high because the patients could be given immunosuppressive drugs. They could be under or over treated. Um, so we, we thought that this would be an interesting problem to target if you have so many of these, these cases at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And we trained this on a large cohort uh, of about a thousand biopsies from the Brigham and Women's Hospital and adapted it to independent test cohorts that were coming from Turkey and from Switzerland. And uh, we did this in a way that was sort of, uh, we tried to diversify the data sets as much as possible by using different slide scanners at, at every, um, every external site, uh, while also looking at um, other forms of uh, difference, like, like uh, slide staining mechanisms. In Turkey, it was manual. In Switzerland and in the US, it's, it's using uh, uh, you know, mechanical stainers. So the setup was very similar to the clam-based model. Again, it uses ResNet features. And then in this case, it's a, it's a multi-task uh, problem where we're trying to identify whether the, the host light image has cellular rejection, antibody rejection, or quilty lesions, which are benign mimickers of rejection, followed by also trying to grade the cases as high versus low, low grade. And um, we found that the models were adaptable to, at least to a degree, but uh, there were large, large differences. This is without using any form of, uh, uh, of, of stain normalization or any form of you know, uh, domain adaptation whatsoever. Um, and, but in general, the, the models were adaptable. I, I, I think that this, because the, 
um, the, the results presented here are based on the, the diagnosis that was assigned at, at, at each one of those individual sites. This doesn't sort of convey the full picture of how well the model is doing or not. That's one thing. The other thing is that there can be quite a lot of noisy labels because there is large disagreement between um, among pathologists. And this sort of brings us back to what I was saying earlier that you know, biology is, is inherently continuous and binning the, the patients into sort of this, this kind of risk group of whether they have rejection or not. Um, that may be the case, but to what degree, maybe the grade can give you some answer, but that could also be a, a discretization of a, of a continuous process. So we looked at, um, uh, we looked at the, the high tension region that did correspond with, with regions that a pathologist would typically interpret to, to make these predictions on all three of the test cohorts. And then we did quite a lot of analysis on, on incorrect cases. But I think the more interesting analysis is perhaps that we, we had five uh, cardiac pathologists grade these uh, biopsies. And then we, we determined, uh, sort of look, looked into what the agreement is among the five pathologists, as well as what the agreement is between the pathologist and the AI model. So we, we found that it was very, very comparable on, on, on the Cohen's Kappa scale, which takes into account agreement by, by chance. But I think the more interesting result is perhaps, how does the interpretation improve when we have uh, the, the, the predictions from the model as well as the, the heat map available to the, to the pathologist. So, so we, in this case, we had, we had um, five pathologists that were randomly given uh, either the whole slide image or uh, the whole slide image and the, uh, and, the, and the heat map with the prediction and everything available to them, uh, followed by uh, repeating this test after, after a washout period and then reversing who gets which, uh, which slide. Um, and we found that there was an improvement in predicting everything basically for predicting cellular, drastic improvement in predicting antibody, which is typically not done on, on h &E alone, is done after an IHC stain, an improvement in, in, in identifying protein lesions, as well as a drastic improvement in agreement of, of grades. So, so pathologists in general could agree more um, when uh, they had the, 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 whole, uh, the, the heat map uh, available to them. And the assessment time went down went down as well. So before I move on to the next one, if, if there are any questions about this particular study, I can ask them now. Does anybody have any questions? Please either type or you can raise your hand and ask them yourself if you wish. Okay, we have a question. So how can pathologists from low resource organizations benefit in the absence of a scanner? I guess this is not um, with regards to what you've just specifically presented here, but if you can, yeah, shed some light, that would be great. So I, I think that, um, so, so I, I think in, in the absence of a slide scanner, there, there are many different ways. I think, I, I think as I mentioned earlier, uh, capturing images with a cell phone that's coupled to a microscope is, uh, is common. But of course, we cannot standardize it, right? So it's difficult for us to standardize it because we don't know what kind of cell phone people are going to use. We don't know what microscope are people going to use, um, and it's difficult to have that kind of, you know, diversity for us to check uh, as as to how to, how adaptable the images are. Uh, so that's one solution. But the other solution, I mean, as I presented, was to use um, a three D printed microscope, which is is cheap. It's it's it, I think it costs like three hundred dollars, including everything built in. Um, uh, to, to, to build it. And if you have something like that in lower source settings, then we, we can control the standardization at least of, of the image collection procedure. You also um, presented in your CLAM paper as well, didn't you? And you um, discussed it earlier where you had the mobile phone taking a photo down the microscope. Right, so, 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 so you... that's what I was, I was getting to, that that, that that procedure is not very standardized itself. So we don't know, like in a lower source setting, what kind of microscope they would have and what kind of a cell phone they would use. So the images we we often get from those settings are, it could be it could be a variety of qualities, right? And the samples could be prepared in a certain way. So 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 it's difficult to standardize that. Yeah, exactly. Let's ch chat. Um, so there's a, a comment saying that. One of the participants noticed 
that there was a slight difference in the pixel sizes from um, different data from different countries. Yeah. So do you think it will have an impact on the results? It would. So uh, if you look at the, the CLAM article, it's supplement. We did, we did uh, quite a lot of experimentation around that, looking at uh, different micron per pixel resolutions and what happens if you can standardize the micron per pixel resolution. So it is possible to you know, uh, do some kind of post-processing at a patch level and standardize the micron per pixel. Uh, resolution. It absolutely has a difference. Uh, sometimes the difference is more pronounced. If, of course, if the difference between micron per pixel resolution is, is drastic, you are going to feel drastic. I mean, you are going to get drastically different, different results. We did find that it is becoming more standard among some of the modern scanners, but um, if you have an old scanner, it could be very, very different from, from what the current, current scanners have. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess from one of your previous slides, you, you showed that each country had potentially a different scanner associated. So the difference in the yeah. countries is, of course, the difference, yeah. right? Yeah, the, the, the micron per pixel resolution for all of them were is, is different. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. So I think in the interest of time, let's um, continue, if we can, please. Okay, um, so moving on, I, I, I think I'll just say a few words about this. I'm not going uh, uh, go to go into this deeper just to get, get to the next part of the part of the talk, but uh, using the clam based setup, we also came up with a federated learning architecture, which is publicly available. And I guess it's being used by people for actual exper uh, for actual experiments uh, now. But we, we did some analysis on this where we showed that you could uh, target both classification as well as survival or outcome prediction problems in a federated setting where the data is distributed across multiple sites and protected by some form of differential, differential privacy and how it does for using very, very basic aggregation functions just averaging and so forth. Here are some examples for uh, breast cancer subtyping as well as for renal cell carcinoma subtyping. And we did a lot of analysis on this. I, I think there's a preprint for this that's already available, but the article which with, with many more details around it would, would be coming out, uh, coming out soon. Um, so uh, I know we have limited time left, but I'll try to cover this as, as quickly as I can. So I'll talk about integrating uh, data from multiple multiple sources, integrating data from astrology and, and genomics. So, so what's the motivation behind this? So diagnosis these days is inherently multimodal. So you have whole, uh, and gliomas are a very good example of this. You have whole slide uh, images that can give you an interpretation of, uh, of grade and the grade is, is basically essentially patient stratification into distinct, distinct risk groups. And you can do the same using molecular profiles and the mod modern who paradigm uses both a molecular interpretation as well as whole slide level interpretation to to uh, make a make a relevant uh, relevant diagnosis. So the diagnosis is increasingly becoming multimodal. We also know that that uh, there is a lot of work showing that you can use the histology images, whether on a patch level or a whole slide level, to to come to something like this, where you can stratify patients into distinct risk groups on its own and compare it with grade, and and it's 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 very comparable. And you can do the same for molecular profiles. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to integrate them and we wanted to find a, find a better way than just, than just using simple concatenation. So we did two things basically in this study. Uh, so we, used, we also used graph convolutional networks to make it a little bit more context aware. And then, and then we used tensor fusion. The image, you know, it, looks, it looks a bit fancy, but it's, it's just a chronic product between the three feature vectors. So you can train each one of these networks uh, individually and then train everything end to end after the, after the uh, chronicer product and, and we showed examples in diagnosis as well as in um, in, in survival prediction um, so the, the GCN based setup is very simple uh, segment the nuclei build a graph and then GCNs on top of it followed by a cost proportional hazard hazard model we also had uh, attention getting in there so we could project one modality onto, onto the other how much that helps really depends on the disease model uh, often did not help very much um, Initially, this was tested on uh, a combined cohort of GBM and LGG, so glioblastoma and low-grade gliomas, as well as on clear cell renal cell carcinomas. Um, and we found that we could stratify patients into distinct groups, groups better when combining histology and their, and their molecular profile. There's quite a lot of analysis around this in the paper. Interpretation, we could go in and look at what regions were used to make those uh, predictions. And uh, both on a GCN level, as well as on the uh, on, on, the, on the patch level. Um, and then we could also look at what was important in the molecular profile and how those, uh, those features sort of shift when, when you're using both the histology and the image. And we repeated this for clear cell renal cell carcinoma. So this was published in 
in uh, in IEEE TMI, and the article has much more details about this. Um, since then, we have expanded this further into a pan-cancer study where we are integrating data from, from whole slide images. So the whole slide part of it, this is very similar to the clam-based setups where we use the whole slide image and slide level uh, survival, essentially. Uh, and then we also use the entire molecular profile, so chronicle product, and similar setup just, just on whole slide images rather than using regions of interest. But what we do next is, is perhaps more interesting, where we look at whole slide level heat maps, uh, take the highest attention regions, and then quantify everything in the tissue micro architecture. And then we could say what was important in the high risk versus lowest cohorts. Um, and then essentially do the same in the molecular profile, what was important for um, in, in, the, in the genomic profile and how it changes when the image is also, also included. So we did this with 14 different cancer types, and I think nine out of the 14 uh, cancer types were. Uh, separable in a statistically significant manner. And we also looked into which cancer types benefited from having the, the image included. Um, and you can see examples of, of, uh, of glioblastomas and, and uh, uh, renal papillary cell carcinoma and so forth, having, having more of a benefit. This is, this is indicating that which cancer types would benefit from having sort of these uh, quote unquote image omic assays uh, for patient stratification rather than just a genomic based based assay. Um, here's a, so, so we have this de detailed analysis for every cancer type out there but, uh, that, that, was, that was studied in the in the study. Um, but this, this particularly shows how separable patients are when using the molecular profile, how separable they are using just histology, and how separable they become when using both histology and genomics. What, what molecular profile was important and how it shifts when, when it goes to multimodal. And within the high attention regions, what uh, what features were most important that were driving those predictions for high versus low risk patients. Um, we did quite a lot of analysis on this and we also found that the model on its own sort of picks out what the, um, picks out that tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are predictive of, of better outcomes. This is, this is of course in line with what the community is thinking about uh, cancers that elicit an immune response. But the interesting part here is that the model identifies this on its own on, at a whole slide image image level rather than us sort of, uh, making that determination first and then correlating it with the outcome. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just jump onto the next and then we can take the questions uh, towards the end. So, so this, this is some work that we did on synthetic data generation for nuclear segmentation. This is some old work, but I think the interesting part here is that we have since extended this to, uh, to larger patches generating, generating very, very complicated synthetic data morphologies. And then now we have sort of further expanded this to uh, rare tumors, in particular childhood rare rare tumors. Um, this is not an example of that. This is an example for 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 uh, for renal cell carcinoma subtyping, where we showed that including real and synthetic images improves the the accuracy and the AUC for uh, for for training those models. And and we are very interested in how regulatory approvals for for models that are trained on synthetic data are being being handled. We we talked talked about this in a comment that we published in Nature BME recently. Um, just to, I mean, before we close, I'm just gonna talk about just a, just a small small project. So, 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 so we we're looking into GAN-based uh, methods for converting between frozen sections and FFPE, uh, uh, FFPE uh, slides. And the reason to do that is, I, I think some people are already familiar with this problem, but frozen sections are used for interpretation, for immediate interpretation during surgery, but have large artifacts. Uh, in the US, uh, pathologists require special training additional fellowships to make start making diagnoses, diagnoses on frozen sections. Um, so we thought that can be used uh, GANs to, to sort of uh, translate between the two since the image to image translation paradigms are so strong. Uh, and uh, we've done quite a lot of work around this, looking at frozen sections and how they translate into, into FF, FFPE for a variety of different disease models as well as downstream interpretations by pathologists and, and how it can actually improve uh, clinical workflow. Can pathologists who are not trained in making diagnosis on, on frozen sections uh, make diagnosis on, uh, on uh, FFPE tissue or pseudo FFPE tissue that was translated after uh, a deep, uh, um, a, a GAN-based model. And the last uh, thing I'll talk about is uh, disparities and biases in, in AI models. We, uh, this is something that we are very interested in investigating a lot of the work that's done in computational pathology often uses large patient uh, repositories like the TCGA to train these models. And, and we, we showed in some very basic analysis that if you train these models on 
the TCGA for lung cancer subtyping and breast, breast cancer subtyping using um, the entire data that was available and then study uh, and then adapt it to an independent test score and stratify it by race, we, we found that the model has dr had drastically different performance when, when the test set was stratified, stratified by race. This is sort of a call for action, if you will, to, to develop more um, you know, equitable models and uh, bring that into computational pathology. So uh, I've, I've had the fortune of working with some very smart graduate students and postdocs that have really led most of this work. So I, I'd like to thank everyone in the group as well as all the funding that we have received to, uh, um, to do some of this work. Brilliant, thank you so much, Faisal. That was an absolutely brilliant presentation, really exciting. Um, so if you have time for maybe two or three questions, I know we are two minutes over time. Would you mind us, us asking maybe two or three yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah we, can, yeah, we can. Okay, Brielle. So just going to ask one from the chat from Aminar. And she asks um, about the clustering step in CLAM. So she wonders whether it's essential for obtaining a good performance or is there a possibility for removing this clustering step and still um, retaining a good level of performance? So there is a possibility of removing that step and retaining a good level of, uh, level of performance. We found that it drastically um, depended on the disease model that you're, you're looking at. Um, there, is some, uh, there are some results in the, in the, in the article, in the, in the supplement, um, where we did some ablation studies around this but it heavily depends on the disease model. If the disease model is so you know, easy that you can use 30, 30 slides and run very basic ML and still get very, very good performance, yeah, in general, it's not gonna have you know, uh, a big difference. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Has anybody got any questions from the audience? I have a couple of quick ones, if I may, Simon. Yeah, yeah please do. Yes, first of all, thank you very much Hessel, for that really um, inspirational talk um, and uh, really impressive stuff. Congratulations again. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. So first one is related to um, the kind of whole um, paradigm of patch-based analysis, which is what um, um, almost everyone is um, uh, using. What's your view on um, the fact that none of these patches is independent um, where we are, you know, all the time treating them as independent samples, um, you know, calculating features on them or doing whatever downstream analysis is we're doing on these. Um, and, and my second question is in relation to the um, last work that you presented, uh, which is I think unpublished uh, with GANs for um, frozen to FFPE transformation. Um, how do you, how, how do you go about um, testing the, the validity of that um, generated data? Yeah. So uh, thanks for the question. So, so, so I'll, I'll uh, answer the, the, the second one first. So the way we have validated this so far is, is, is sort of twofold. So, so the first one is by showing a lot of this generated um, images and seeing whether uh, the pathologists or experts who are looking into at, at these cases can tell whether the sample is FFPE versus frozen section. Uh, and we did some, some analysis on that. Um, and then that was followed up by stitching those back together. And once we had the, 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 the synthesized whole slide level image, and then we asked them to make a diagnosis on that. And then we, uh, the, the conclusion that we are still trying to get to is that can this diagnosis be sort of non-inferior to the diagnosis that one would get on an actual FFP sample? So that's been the workflow. It's 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 uh, it's obviously not not perfect. Um, we would like to do it with, with many many more disease models uh, and essentially more complicated disease models, but it's also limited by how many samples we have available, how many samples can we get in sort of independent test cohorts and so forth. Um, so that's been the, uh, the the general evaluation paradigm. For your first question, I, I completely agree. You know, this, these are you know, diagnosis uh, made by humans is never at a single magnification. It's never made on on you know uh, individual individual patches. Um, 
And I, I think that we do need to develop more, more context aware methods. Um, but the interpretations are uh, for, for, for many of these disease models, right? Where, you know, so some of the tasks that admittedly us and a lot of people in computational pathology target are so easy sometimes for pathologists that they would look at a slide with, without using a microscope and still be able to tell what, what it is. Um, I think for many of those tasks and, and, and many tasks where uh, there, there are large repeating, repeating structures, um, it's, it is possible for the model to get very, very high performance just by using the patches. Um, and pathologists can make, a, make the prediction on, on the patches. So the, the, the difference we've seen with some, some of the work that we're currently doing, for example, in, in the renal pathology, where the diagnosis is much, much more complicated and the context matters much more, uh, these models often don't do very well. Very good. Okay, brilliant. So I think we are eight minutes over now, so I think we should let you go, Faisal. Um, but once again, thank you so, so much for a brilliant presentation. I'm sure we all thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Faisal. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.